This program is dedicated to those that paid for their lives at the hands of the state. Welcome to another edition of Silent Voices, the only program in America that you, the viewer, can use your voice on the child welfare system. I am Dennis Lawrence, and beside me is the lovely Maria Milene, our co-host. Maria, what do we have up first for our audience? We have an incredible program for you today. We're going to start by looking at the child uh, welfare system and I think we'll begin, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Legally Kidnapped. Good morning. I'm the trial judge in your child abuse case. You are going to waive the reading of the allegations against you. Your children are in foster care placement because the attorney for the children said that they are very afraid of you. I have worked with the attorney for the child for years and I believe everything she says. I understand you did not get served with the summons to this case. That doesn't matter. You're here anyway. If you need counsel, we have a free attorney available for you who is certified by the court. If you hire private counsel, he better behave in this court. I will not hesitate to sanction and fine him. I'll write reports to his disciplinary committee for the slightest infraction. Your motion for immediate return of your children is denied. I find there is imminent risk of harm to life or limb for all of your children. You have leave to refile the motion for immediate return of the child, but that hearing will take place over the next four months because my calendar is busy. I will deny your motions for privately retained psychologists to testify because of the risk of trauma to the child because of repeated psychological evaluations. So you'll have to go with what the court psychologist says. I will qualify that psychologist in the area of psychology and allow him to offer an opinion on any area he wishes to discuss. I will find his testimony credible and his report helpful to the court. I will sustain all objections as to the psychologist's qualifications, his disciplinary history, his methodology, and his reliability. That's all irrelevant to this case. I will cut short cross-examination of the court's professionals to save time. I will cut short opposition to motions filed by the Child Protective Services. I used to work for Child Protective Services and I know they are never wrong. I will deny motions to get records, reports, and other evidence. I will not allow subpoenas of either the foster care agency or the Child Protective Services. That's not important. This case is about how you abused your children. I will conduct a fact-finding hearing which I will decide based upon the preponderance of the evidence that you abused or neglected your children. And then I will dispose of this matter based upon clear and convincing evidence that you abused this child. I will conduct permanency hearings once every six months. You may or may not get a report from Child Protective Services in advance of that permanency hearing. If you don't file an appeal, the appellate court will show you and your attorney the seriousness of hurting a child. I will entertain motions and I will issue orders without notice to you. Right now you have an order of protection against you. There is no contact with your child until a further order of the court. If you violate this order, I will hold you in contempt here and I will report you to the district attorney's office to commence criminal prosecution against you as well. This does not violate the prohibition against double jeopardy. If any of your privately retained professionals commit misconduct, I will file complaints with their licensing committees. I see that you have an order of child support for the child. You will continue to pay child support. You do not have to see the child to pay support. I will incarcerate you if you do not pay support. Throughout this case, I will be on the bench whenever I feel like it. 
If I am not here, you will have to wait until my court staff tells you that the case is adjourned and you will return months later. All motions will be continued to that date and I will not have another judge preside in my absence. This case is too important for that. Any attorney who fails to appear before me will get an order to show cause for contempt unless they work for the government. Your failure to appear before me will result in default and I will dispose of the case forthwith. Do you have any questions? How do you plead? This case will now be continued for the next six months. Have a good day. Every week we feature a guest that comes and tells their horror story from the family court system mm -hmm. or CPS. Um, the only way we can make an impact is by bringing these stories to light and showing what is taking place in the system. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this week's guest. It's my honor to introduce you all today to Alexandra Cervantes. Um, it's very good to meet you. Nice to meet you too. I understand that you have a really bad case um, with CPS that's been pretty difficult. And um, I was wondering if you could talk to us about that today. Oh yes, it'd be an honor. And we appreciate you coming in. Oh yeah, thank you. Um, how did you first enter the system? I had first entered the system in December 2012. My child was abused and had bruising on his back, so I took him to the emergency room just to make sure that that was what it, what it is, was just contusion, which is bruising. And that's what it was. So when I took him to the emergency room, the emergency room contacted CPS, and that's how I became involved. What was your caseworker's concerns at that time um, in regards to your child? Um, the safety concerns were about staying away from the father since my baby's timeline was most of the day he was with the father for about 10 hours. So the concern was just staying away from my baby's father. And at that time, how did CPS treat your family? Um, at that time, I had felt that they were being very biased towards my family. They um, denied my, ch my child being placed with my parents. They were denying my uncles and aunts. I don't think we were being treated fairly at all. Okay. It's my understanding that um that your son did end up being placed with a family member. How did that take place? Um, that took place about two months after he was already with the non-relative placement. I was pushing and pushing for them to place my babies with my aunt and uncle. And what I had to do was bring up the name Ombudsman, which they are an advocate for people going through the system and so once I brought up the ombudsman they immediately the next day placed my baby with my aunt and uncle because the family was going out of the state and I didn't approve and they were trying to court order to have that be okay with the judge and it got accepted the judge the judge accepted that and I wasn't pleased so I told them ombudsman I went there I don't know how many times I showed up at the DHS place that day and then finally they said okay 
we'll do this, this, and that, and then they got them in there the next day and did the home study after they already placed them there. So I think they knew that what they were doing wasn't appropriate. They, they didn't want to get investigated. So you don't believe that they were doing what was best for your son at that time? Right, exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit more about um, what the safety plan was for um, regaining custody of your son and how often did you have visits with him? Yes. Um, at first the safety plan was that since my baby was still with me that couldn't be around the father, no one else but me could be alone with my child, um, that if anything were to happen to my child, as in he fell or got hurt, I had to contact CPS immediately. Um, but then my visits at first started to be just three hours a week. So I got to see them twice, or I got to see my first child twice a week for only an hour and a half. And did you successfully reach that goal and regain custody of your minor son? Um, I did. I was pregnant at the time when my first child was taken from me. So my goal was to have Malachi back under my care before I gave birth to my second child. Um, I had completed that goal successfully. I did everything they asked me, parenting classes, domestic violence counseling. I participated in drug screens once a week. I also voluntarily did Al-Anon classes. I did um, individual counseling with another family referred service that was all from DHS. I, I got a lot of compliments from the judge when I was first in the system, but during when I got the child, my child taken from me the second time, it was a complete different story. So. Now, I have a question for, for you. Did you have previous drug convictions? Is that, is that why the court was trying to require you, you know, to... No, I just, they based my person on what the father was. They thought of me as how am I attracted to or want to be having a family with somebody of such a criminal background that there must be something wrong with me too. Okay. So I feel like that's why they had me under drug screens. Okay, so then you had two children mm -hmm. um, and I understand that things were going good for you. Oh yes. And what, what happened after that? Well, on September 5th of last year, mm -hmm. I had gone to this hotel which the father of my child was staying at and my children had been removed because he had been involved with a lot of criminal activity. Um, I did not, I was not aware of what he was involved in. I did know that he had suspended licenses and whatnot and that that's maybe why they, he had a warrant and maybe the cops went over there. But um, nothing, nothing's expected that my children are going to be taken from me because I was driving in a public place. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you don't feel there was any reason for them to remove your children? Oh, no. My, my youngest was eight days old when he was taken from me. My oldest was one and a half. I mean, I was in the parking lot for three hours until they got all the paperwork that I requested because they weren't going to show me any removal paperwork. I had to ask them. So about an hour and a half later, they showed back up at the scene and my babies were just, were all just waiting in the car just for my children to be taken from me. And I don't know what warranted it, but it just seemed like there's nothing I could do. I had no say, nothing. That had to be really hard on you. I'm oh sorry. yeah, and my my one year old was screaming. He was leaving with strangers. Was there any type of paperwork, or did you um, have any understanding on why they were removing the children at that point? Their reasoning was that I was going to be letting my children be 
involved with all this criminal activity. Um, like, I st like I said that I had to request from the CPS investigator a re removal paperwork because they weren't going to show me anything. And so she had to go get that signed. But even I've heard that, I mean, it's the law that a judge has to go over why your child is being removed from you. And I don't feel like he really did that. I maybe think, I don't know if anybody's heard of rubber stamping, that the judge just got my pa the removal papers stamped, and that's why my children are removed, which I feel like when removing a child, a newborn from a mother, there should be more standards, definitely. Not just some paper, not just some strangers coming in your life and removing your children from you. I definitely agree with that. Mm -hmm. um, again, the baby that was removed was eight days old. Um, and that's got to be one of the worst things you can go oh, yeah. through. I was breastfeeding everything. Uh, were you represented by an attorney at, in the court case? I was represented by an attorney, although um, it was a court-appointed attorney. And it's my understanding that there was also a caseworker that was involved with your family? Yes, there was. And did the court then did the court then um, set up new requirements for you to regain custody of your children? Yes, I pretty much repeated what I did the first time. And um, in court, they kept saying that I was never going to benefit and for the likelihood of the, my children's well-being, considering their age, it was more appropriate to put them up for adoption but than to reunify my family. So you didn't have a lot of options in regards to getting mm. your children back? Nope. I feel like what happened is that they went through procedure steps and steps to make sure that they covered you know, everything they had to do in order to successfully terminate my rights. Now, did you complete your second service plan that CPS oh, yes. had set up Oh, yes. I completed it, and still, I still was in the system for about two and a half more months, requ requesting for more counseling, requesting for more services, and um, nobody responded to me. I was just left and idle until my parental rights were just completely removed. Now, were you able to have visitation with your children up until the time they removed them? Yes, I was able to see them twice a week. What are you doing at this point to um, get your children back under your care? Um, right now, I am appealing my termination. I am going to the Court of Appeals, and I'm working with my attorney on figuring out what we are going to claim. and I. Have, we have been real successful on finding out what we can get this court to reverse my termination and back to the lower court. So I'm feeling really good about it, and I'm also trying to reach out to the media and the public and teaching and educating people about how broken the system is. And that's what we're doing, doing today. And mm -hmm. um, one of the things I wanted to ask you is that with this um, new case, I understand that you're appealing the decision, which any loving parent would do. Mm -hmm. um, you've had court-appointed attorneys. Now, I know you can't predict the future. I know that you can't, you know, say what's going to happen in the future, but how do you feel now about um, the way your attorney is representing your children's best interest? I do feel like it's, she's doing a great job. Um, I just, I can't trust anyone, I've learned that, but I'm just, I have no other feelings towards it. I feel like I have to be optimistic because they're, they're, she's my only voice. And that's why I just, I just want to keep fighting with other people. I want to get a group of people like, together. Like I know that you guys, this is what your goal is to change the system. Yeah. And because I feel like even if I had, 
I hired on a very expensive lawyer. It's not going to change anything. I just feel like whatever they want to do is what they want to do because of their funding. Yeah. As you know, and as you've been finding out through your ordeal, the system is very broken. Mm -hmm. And oh, yes. this is why we're doing the shows, is so hopefully the general public can become aware of what's taking place in the court systems um, with CPS and with the family courts. Um, can you tell me a little bit about um, your experience and talking to other families that have been through this and um, other people that you're aware of? Yeah, I understand you've done some research on that. Oh, yes. Um, I have come across many, many trends. I just feel like every case should be different. And it just seems that CPS has a way of doing things just to have their income. The way that they're funded, I feel like all of that needs to be redone and looked at differently from a perspective of they're dealing with children and mothers and fathers, grandparents, everything. It needs to all be more considerate, I feel, because the things I've read, the things I've heard people say, and it's just, it hurts. I hurt for them, I hurt for myself, my babies, for families all across America going through the same pain as we've been going through. Yeah, so. and I understand you have a wonderful mother who's oh, yes. been a great support system Oh yes, she's the you. best. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell me how you feel about CPS denying her and your father the right to raise your children while you were unable to? It was just a complete shock. I've had past I've had my our pastor write letters on telling how great of a family we've we've been, you know, that they've known us for about 10 years and I've had family members friends, just multiple letters, and I just don't feel that they gave my boys a chance to be part of our family. They were so quick to just take them away. And it's, it's not right at all. Unfortunately, a lot of parents are going through what you're going oh, through. Yeah. Um, I know that this is hard for you to talk about, and I appreciate you you know, taking us through that. Um, can you tell me in general how you think the system could benefit or you as a parent in completing, you know, their safety plan that they set up the first time successfully, having the children removed and then successfully completing it again um, with virtually it seems like nothing that you did to have the children pulled again mm -hmm. um, that was criminal or neglectful or abusive. Um, what do you think could be done differently in that aspect? Um, well, I have to say that I did benefit from the services that they provided for me. I feel like I did gain a lot of knowledge about parenting and whatnot, but nothing is perfect and definitely it's not CPS. And so there's just a lot to work on and I think the people should be trained differently in the system. Just, yeah, I, there's just so much to talk about that type of, those, those situations. So. So what are you, what has your attorney told you to expect at this point? It was, um, was it January of this year that they were yeah. permanently removed? Yes, January 23rd of this year, yes. And can you tell us what your attorney is feeling about that? Um, she's not, she just said she's not going to give me any false hope. We're just going to try. She's a, uh, she said most likely, you know, cases like this don't really get reversed. A lot of termination appeals, they stay terminated unless you keep fighting and fighting and fighting. 
Well, and I think that's, you know, really what we need to focus on is that, you know, we may not make immediate changes, but, you know, we will make changes. The courts mm -hmm. and the CPS need to implement changes. Um, oh, yeah, definitely. In how they do things. Um, we appreciate you coming to talk to us. Oh, thank you. Um, and grateful to have, you know, you stand up and speak for so many mothers and parents who go through this who are afraid of retaliation. Oh, yeah. That's I was until they took my rights away. Yeah. And I feel like I should have done this a long time ago. Okay. Oh, yeah. Well, thank you for coming on the show. <laughs> thank and you. I will be praying for you and take thank care. Thank you so much. <laughs> If you would like to be a guest on Silent Voices, contact us at miparentalrights at gmail.com. That's miparentalrights at gmail.com. Maria, there's a terrible wall that I would hate to have my picture hanging on, and that's the Michigan for Parental Rights Wall of Shame. The NPR Wall of Shame is dedicated to social workers, judges, foster parents that deliberately abuse and neglect children, both physically and mentally. Backed by popular demand, the Michigan for Parental Rights Wall of Shame. This, my friends, is Robert Ruther. He was a social social worker for the school system. He was also has been charged with taking custodial indecent liberties with a 13 year old boy. I'm not sure exactly what indecent social liberties are, but I know I don't want it done to my kids by some man put in a place that is supposed to protect them. Robert Rother, you're on the Michigan for Parental Rights Wall of Shame. I want to thank you for watching this week's edition of Silent Voices. You can tune in next week, same time and same channel. Remember, your, your voice, voice can, can make, make a the difference. difference.